need some more speed records in this day and age. You need coverage. Coverage? Oh, you mean them little root weevils that crawl around popping off cameras in your face? Those root weevils write history. Many of you know that quote by Jack Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths. So when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable scene in Network, you'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com at Revolution Radio. Our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hila Cass, MD, Melanie Richton, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trallo, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, DODDS, Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. You decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. And that's right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you have Come on. I'm My kids sorry are starving. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So if food prices go crazy... The shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need to ask humans to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the megacorps to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What we do in life, it goes in eternity. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good day. This is Joe Kiernan. Welcome to Researchers on a Mission Radio. Uh, joined, as always, co-hosting my main man, Dave Sinet. Dave, how are you this evening? Good evening, Joe. How's how are everything? you making out? Oh, man. Everything's good. It's weather, spring oh, time's here, you we're, know? Yeah, we're just getting a taste of it here, and then the weather service came through today, and they're expecting a big nor'easter somewhere between Tuesday and Wednesday for us to get waffled with more snow, so... We're, we're uh, yeah, we're pointing our finger fingers against the fingled finger fingled. You know, what what fingled is going on? Right now. I don't know, man. But I we're, we're it on the news here. Finally about got some sixty degree weather. <laughs> just enough to to give you a taste of it. <laughs> just enough to get you sick, really. Exactly. But I I heard on the news down here they were talking about the storm that's heading up your way and they uh, it's called the nor'eastern bomb. They're referring to it down here. <laughs> Did, yeah, is that exactly. new, the news up there too? Yeah, because this so, is the know, first I've like, heard bomb related to a weather at anything. So, uh, yeah, hell, they name they name the winter storms now like they do hurricanes. 
I know. I know. When did they start that? They should start naming them after terrorists. It'd be a lot. It'd mean a lot more. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. I, I didn't get to slide you. Tim's here. Tim C's always here. How's it going, guys? Tim, hey, Tim. It's nice to hear your voice, Tim. <laughs> I know you got a ton of snow up there. Do you still have snow too? Oh, very little. It, okay. Most of it melted, but uh, just enough to make it muddy and nasty out. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what a, what a strange another, winter. Uh, another week of cold weather. Can't wait. What, what a really strange winter just uh, pretty much everywhere. It's going to be one terrible spring, I'm sure, when everything melts. So it's going to be it's going to be some terrible. Actually, I think we got a little lucky because if all of that snow melted in just a few days, we probably would have had massive flooding. Yeah, I'm always worried about the the Midwest. They always get the, the like the Montanas melt out and flood the Mississippi pretty good. Wrecks the crops. Pretty crazy. Not as crazy. I'm going to use this segue to the craziest thing going on. Guys, I heard about a plane that might be missing. Has anyone heard about this thing? <laughs> <laughs> Someone mentioned it. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I had a, a few suspicions, right? You, you hear a few ideas that get tossed around. And what's pretty cool is, you know, everyone's really still has a million different ideas. Uh, but... <laughs> I, I all in all, I figured they'd at least find it by now, you know, or if it was uh, taken for another purpose, it would uh, be revealed by now. Uh, Dave, what what what's going on with this plane? What are you hearing about this plane? Yeah, yeah. Un fortunately or unfortunately, I hang out with a lot of older researchers, and s some of them have like really gone off the rails on this. So I'm the guy like sticking fingers in everybody's eyes, trying to get, <laughs> you know, try, trying to get him back down to the ground. But yeah, you know, it, it's I think initially when it came off, you had a lot of the UFO community, or you know, some of those in the UFO community, you know, it got snatched by a flying saucer, and we're like, oh, let's let's you know, just keep our feet on the ground before we start going there. And then it was you know, they, they had guys with the radar returns, and they're showing this, and a blip comes in from the left hand side, and it, it's a circle, and everybody's like, "Look, it's a flying saucer." I'm just like, "It's just unidentified at this point." You know, to take it easy. Yeah. So yeah. we've gotten a lot of this stuff, but I mean, the the last credible evidence or reporting I got on this uh, initially, the the authorities in Malaysia evidently are saying that it was hijacked. And that was their that was their summary of what's gone on. I've also heard that uh, they were tracking the plane and it was doing radar avoidance techniques. Now, if you remember the all the all the communication systems and all the radar systems and the black boxes and all that stuff was turned off, so they couldn't track it by the normal means that they would track a, an air flight. Right now. With the, they were able. You're able to track the blips because you're getting radar returns off the off the airframe. But what they were saying was is that they they found that this plane was doing radar avoidance techniques under 5,000 feet in, in the air. So it was seeing if it could fly low enough wow. to avoid radar and not having their stuff on it. Now the there's a, a lot of little interesting developments. I think General McInerney. Uh, was on Fox News the other night or last night. Maybe it was even today. I forget when the feed came through. But he says he has has from a good source that that plane uh, is in Pakistan. It landed in Pakistan. Now, another little interesting development is, is that Israel, now they said they, they're doing it due to union, you know, union grumbles, but they've closed down all their, all of their cons consulates, according to this one report. So I know that Israel, since the event, has been on a heightened state of alert because there's a, a lot of people within the intelligence community and and you know that realm who think that this plane's going to you know there there was there's another facet to it, but they think that perhaps the plane's going to be outfitted with some you know heavy duty stuff and they're going to fly it into some city over there and I, evidently Israel seems to think that they may get a, get a, a a bit of that, so they're on high alert. Now another aspect to this is is that. Supposedly, there was four uh, engineers on there at, that worked for Freestone. Now, Freestone is a, some sort of semiconductor company uh, in Texas. And supposedly, each of these four Chinese guys owned 20% of the patent for, for some sort of semiconductor they developed. Now, supposedly, the contract states that if all four of these guys die, 
then the company uh, gets all their shares, basically now controls that patent. So people are trying to find out what exactly, what is, what's this patent, um, you know, who Freestone is uh, owned and operated by, and there's some various conjectures I don't really throw out there. I'm sure people can find that for themselves. But uh, so, no. yeah, it seems no. to be a bit of a mystery. And, uh, you know, you've got this going on. You've got the Russian stuff going on and the pissing match between, you know, the Obama administration and sanctions on Russia. And so people seem to be getting a little bit bit twitchy that something's something's going to cut loose because everybody seems to have lost their minds all of a sudden. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Everyone knows uh, tensions high and a <clears throat> A passenger airliner is just gone. And what now, in regards to the maneuvering, uh, let, let's start fresh up with it. They have to manually turn off these transponders and these communication devices, right? Supposedly. Now, first of all, I don't understand why they should be, anyone should be able to turn off a transponder you know i i would i would just like to think that's just you know uh, an automatic like a fire alarm that's that's hardwired you know that's you know that's where at least it's supposed to be <laughs> uh i think that would would have been uh, pretty helpful but regardless if they if they can't find any of this stuff it, it's incredible but now why would they be looking so far out into the indian ocean as uh they all claim to be because of the turn, the turn that it made. Apparently, it took an abrupt turn. Um, I guess in that area of the world, it would be to the west. But you know, I I also I also know that <laughs> it's going to be a, another day or two before we really start getting some good satellite information because no country really wants to admit, yeah, uh, where their cameras were, where they were taking pictures at certain times. So. It, it, you're going to see a, a slow trickle of satellites, but I mean, there's uh, something to be said for that, Joe. But, yeah. but my big, my big stance on this from the beginning is, hey, we can track every little meteorite coming into our into our atmosphere. I mean, we've right. got stuff that people they know exactly where, where the plane is. Don't let anybody kid you. And it's exactly you know part of part of the reason is nobody wants to give up the fact that what what their actual you know sat you know their satellite spying capabilities are so That's everybody's right. kind of keeping you know playing everything close to their chest which i can understand but i mean don't let anybody fool you they know exactly where that plane's at you know my my true feeling is and, and a lot of a lot of people i've told my thoughts to on this have just said oh you're you know that's another conspiracy theory not whatever but firmly i i i I've, I've felt from the beginning it had terrorism written all over it just because of the iranian connection number one and, you know, so what if, if that's uh, stereotypical? But the fact of the matter is the people that steal these damn things, that steal an airplane or hijack an airplane and crash it or do whatever they want to do with it, people that are doing it are from that area of the world. And um, worse than that, there was also uh, high levels – I'll put it this way. There was a lot of cargo on the ship, on the plane that was uh, lithium batteries, which is highly flammable, highly explosive. You know, I, I heard of this too. Um, Why but, would there be a lot of lithium batteries on the plane? Uh, you know, it was cargo. Because I, mean, I know if I'm going to fly with, with my, my good camera, mm -hmm. I'm only allowed to bring one battery, and it's not allowed to no, go I, in I the overhead I, compartment. I think the amounts that, were, that they're talking about was probably – commercial amount for some reason maybe yeah. maybe a company was using it you know to ship it to another country for or wherever it was going yeah. where was it going to uh, Bangladesh or where well I, I know that times they do have uh, problems with lithium batteries I, I do know that right. that does exist and that's why it is limited so I was just curious as to you know that sure. that would be a flag and also what's the deal with the the people with their stolen passports so with these so is it safe to say that it's most likely a, a a straight out hijacking and just a, uh, and uh, someone just ba basically confiscated the plane, just took the plane somewhere. Yeah, well, nothing for nothing. I mean, we only have one group nowadays. It seems to be you know wreaking havoc everywhere. So, and it looks like it's you know people from that faction. So, is anyone yeah. claiming? Uh, that's the thing. No one has. No, no one's group officially has either. claimed it. However, that's not the first time in recent that. It's taken weeks for uh, groups to, 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 you know, to take claim to some certain attacks or actions, whatever they call them. And, 
there's another aspect of this that I, I that I don't think anyone's really talked about, but there is a, 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 a I'll put it to you this way, in the United States, it just seems that there's a, a push to allow let's just say the nation of Islam to have a greater influence over what's going on in the world. And yeah. it's there's bad a, PR. A lot of card playing right now. It's bad yeah. PR to have something like this happen. If it was on, if it was, you know, by, well, so there might be, there might there be a, a G seven or G eight summit this week as there well. Is. There is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I Very should, interesting which is really stuff, but you know, which is really bizarre. I mean, I mean, we see it in our own country and it seems like, our country, even with the you know the the Arab Spring you know nonsense going on over in Egypt, and fortunately for social media, we're getting the feeds right off the ground, so we know what's going on. But it's like we're backing all the wrong people. We're arming the people we are just fighting against in Afghanistan. It's just like well, what, what exactly is going on here? And this is this is the prime time as as I guess conspiracy researchers or whatever is that you watch the other hand, see, you know, they got all the shiny stuff out here for everybody to go ooh and ah and, and dig into and be curious about, but watch what the other hand's doing. Cause that's, you know, and, and if nobody saw it this week, uh, it was Thursday or Friday, but I think the Obama administration gave over our internet to the, the Europeans. So huge. News. I'm not sure who, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure who they are, but <laughs> basically it's, right. a, it, I think, uh, forget who, who said it, but it's it, uh, somebody came out and said, you know, it's a huge gift to dictators all across the world. And, you know, if you look at it that from that, that I've stance, been hearing that quote all too often these days. Yeah, it's <laughs> scary, man. I, I don't know. It's just well, not here, by the way. There's, there's also happens. another theory on this plane that uh, I was reading on. And uh, it's really not even something that I even come close to bring with uh, a pilot suicide. Uh, they say that this has happened before. Uh, they gave Actually, an Joe. Go ahead, David. Please. No, as I say, you make you 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 nailed it, because uh, there was a, a show I was watching, but it, they had a a seven seventy seven pilot on there, and he was retired. But th he was saying there's three things that could happen to this plane. Either somebody brought a bomb on it, and it would have to be a really big bomb to smoke a seven you know, seven seventy seven. Because the other thing would be a missile. He goes or the pilot went jihad, and we've. I think one of the New York flights that went down after 9/11 in Pennsylvania. Uh, they did, yeah, they didn't want to release it, but you heard the pilot. You heard the pilot saying "Allah Akbar," and the plane took a nosedive into the ground. Evidently, right. this you know, these, it, it, they seem to be able to. Uh, yeah. Well, it's. I was reading the same thing. I was reading that this has happened before. And uh, they even gave a few instances, usually on smaller aircrafts. But they they mentioned here that in 1999, the, the crash near Nantucket, which killed all 217 people above uh, on board Egypt Air Flight 990, was the result of a co-pilot deliberately flying the plane into the sea, uh, as found by U.S. investigators. Uh, however, it is notated that Egyptian investigators dispute that finding in detail. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, well, evident, evidently, there's a movie coming out, or it's, it's out already, it might be, but uh, I was listening to it on some talk show program, and it's about the, the, uh, the one flight over New York where people said they saw a missile go up and hit this plane. Well, oh, right. Yeah, they this had is the one of off of Long Island. Yeah, that's yeah, the one. yeah, exactly. Yeah, Flight 487 this. or something okay. like that. Yeah. I remember this one. But they actually had the people who the FBI interrogated, and they're they, for some reason we are really playing down this Islam stuff in, in in our news for some reason. But we're you know it seems to be infiltrating everything. Mm -hmm. But they were they had some of the people, and the guys were like, "Yeah, they, they took me into the other room and said." Yeah, did you see anything? And he goes, I started saying what I was, you know, what I saw, this, that, and the other. And they say, well, you're up for, you're you're going for your citizenship here, aren't you? And basically, they were threatening these people to shut up. And it was, and evidently enough of these people came out and said, listen, you know, they were, you know, the feds were hard assing us to keep our mouths shut. And we know what we saw. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot more going on out there. And we, we're getting a lot of suppression of the truth through our press, which is nothing new but it seems to be extraordinarily heavy nowadays yeah it really interests me that article i was reading uh with that egyptian uh flight 1999 you know if the, 
because if that one was taken down and we really weren't told about, it's you know, could this 9/11 thing have been going on, you know, much earlier? Because 19, when was the first bomb in Trade Center? 93. 93. 93? Yeah. yeah. That's just interesting because, you know, over here in the States, we really don't hear much about that, especially for a pilot to take a 200 person passenger plane down into the sea. Sure. Uh, yeah, that, pi that pilot said if it if if the, the pilot shot. decided to go to go jihad and took that plane into the ocean, he goes, you know, a 777 at 600 miles an hour into the ocean, he goes, it would leave like little bits and pieces like, you know, you'd hardly even tell it was a plane. Wow. So that's a big impact. So there's the also possible. There's also the possibility that's being kicked around is what they're seeing on radar or on these. Excuse me, on the satellite imaging, in the Indian Ocean is just uh, possibly a shipping container of sorts. Oh yeah, they said it was. Yeah, that's what the that's what and, the report. Uh, and, and that's likely. Right. We know there's tons of them. I know cargo ships lose them literally every day, which big is time. just ridiculous. But uh, well, they're saying that they one really triangle. Do. The one triangle that the Chinese saw on the radar, and it was pretty, it was pretty, pretty vague shot. I have to admit, but they said it turned out to be like a string of plastic or something like that, a bunch of garbage, plastic garbage, all strung together, floating around. Yeah, well, I know we have that same thing in the Pacific. We have a giant pile. It's like a, an eddy, you know. It's just like a a mass pile of plastic and. I know every year they go out there and they test it all to see how fast it's biodegrading. It, it's not. It's, 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 it's just well, growing. You know what's cool, well, you know what's cool is I, I saw a video a while ago, and I actually saved it because it was interesting. But it was a, a Japanese guy, and basically he developed it, and it was like a still. It was like a crock pot with a, you know, like a copper hose going through a little thumper barrel, a little cooling chamber, sure. and then it would have, a, have the outspout. But you take all this plastic – and you take plastic like that or, you know, any plastic you have around the house and you stick it into like the hopper and you lock it down, you, you turn it on and it reverts the plastic back into the, into the fuel again to basically like diesel type fuel. Okay. And he's just like, now every landfill is an oil field. And he was, and I was just like, now that's really cool. You know, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. You figure, yeah. If you have, you have something like that, that would you know, and especially in third world countries, something that can convert their garbage into some sort of fuel is a, is a good thing. Yeah. Well, actually, in Tim's county, Tim does uh, did Taylor Recycling open the plant in Montgomery that's recycling trash into fuel, in, into electricity? Uh, you know, I heard I yeah. heard people saying, yeah, it was opening this and that, but honestly, I don't know. Um, well, I, I'm not even sure if most people know that plastic is a petroleum product. It's, right. it's made from petroleum. So if you're able to take it and, and put it back into a form that you can use to cook or heat your house, it's all good. Yeah. Right. I uh, see this this uh, company in Orange County, New York, Taylor Recycling, uh, has the patent. And uh, they're trying to, to – essentially what they're trying to do is they could take – all of your garbage, let's say a city, and they, let's say a smaller city, and he could build this power plant there, a recycling plant rather, and it takes in all of the city's garbage, and in return, it gives out all electricity. And so you, you do away with your garbage, and you get electricity out of the deal. And uh, it's, it's an incredible deal, but uh, as it goes, all of the good energy ideas, uh, people have to, to fight tooth and nail. Uh, you know what, Joe? Uh, any I support think they, on these things. I think they opened it in Monroe, which is a couple towns over from Montgomery. But uh, yeah, it looks like they did open <coughs> the place opened up, and I guess it is very cool. It's running, very cool. I'm surprised the powers that be didn't smite him. Well, I know he's been battling hard, as you know, Tim. I do know the gentleman, and uh, he's uh, he's a great man, and. Uh, He's been working really hard at it. He's he's, pro he's probably 15, 20 years into trying to make this happen. So the guy's uh, a big believer in his in his dream, and he knows what what could be uh, the outcome of it. So uh, he has my full support, no doubt about it. That's awesome. So enough uh, enough with the plane because um, 
it, it, I'm really blown away about it. I guess I'll say one final thing. I'm just shocked we haven't heard any word about the plane, you know, on the sake of the families, uh, because say, okay, you know, it's, it's been taken here or it, it's been, it's crashed. Like, if Have it's you seen been the taken, photos where of, these, are the of, of the family? Have you oh, seen yeah. the photos of the family screaming and crying? And well, oh my God! No, I awful. figured they have sequestered by now. No, no, in this administration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also heard they're just very good actors, which is always very rude to say. Uh, however, it might be right. I don't know, but uh, you know, it. If the plane was taken, really, what's what's the deal with the with the passengers? Uh, well, oh, and that, and that be... company is Free Scale, incidentally, guys. Mm. I call it Free it's Free Stone, but it's called Free Scale. Right. Free but stuff. yeah, there's a lot. Of guys, there's a lot of guys working that angle, and that's actually when you dig into it a little bit, that's a very interesting angle. I don't know what they developed. Yeah. But uh, the company seems to now own whatever they developed. If, I mean, providing that story is you know on the level. Right. And uh, you know, it's there's a lot of weight to that too, because in the last few years, that has uh, you know uh, things like that, uh, certain chips and certain microprocessors and uh, uh, micro generators and things of that nature have been uh, the most sought after uh, technology. And uh, you know, just like anything, it, it's it's uh, usually for control reasons. But uh, however, it's not too far fetched in my world. Uh, you know, these are. Uh, these are the tools that would be game changers in future technology. So, well, you know, what? I had a I had a speaker at one of my conferences recently, mm -hmm. and he introduced something, and it was I guess it was quasi old news to a certain extent, but it was called a bloom box, I believe, and one of these small boxes, and it had some sort of plating inside of it, and you introduce you know some sort of small amount of propane, <clears throat> and these little boxes could power your entire house. Well, evidently, he didn't take it to the government or anybody, but he went to, I think, to Google and to Amazon. And he says, listen, I can build you big one of these things. And supposedly, he built big versions for both of some of their plants. And I saw something on the web where they, where the representatives from, I think, Amazon said, so far, it's saved us over $200,000 on our electricity. So I, I'm not sure exactly where that ha that's gotten to, but it seems like... Some of some of this new stuff is is being uh, is being utilized, but it's being utilized, you know, on the QT, so you know people yeah. don't get their ears yeah. on it. Well, then we have uh, I don't know if uh, how familiar you guys are with Dr. Searle's uh, zero point energy. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm a big fan of that, uh, only because it, it, as you guys know, I'm a bit of a math dork and history dork, but uh, it, his. His theories and the way he puts it all together, it it 100% uses the same exact math as uh, a lot of other things that are pretty important. So uh, it's just quite ironic that uh, uh, his his whole getup there is built to uh, certain mathematical proportions that uh, that have been uh, laid out through history. And so it's is this the guy that did uh... pretty incredible. That ties to Tesla's work. Uh, it, it's it's something related to that. It, it's a yeah, a lot of what Tesla was probably doing was was things like this. But Dr. Searle was pretty cool. I had a chance to talk to the guy. He he uh, he, he did the zero point energy, and ultimately it's just a, a particular arrangement with magnets. And uh, once he gets it going, and once it's uh, utilized correctly and applied the correct way, uh, it will. Uh, basically run perpetually it'll run forever uh, uh, being that magnets don't wear down and such and um, it was pretty cool when he first discovered it and he got the thing going he had he forgot about a, a he overlooked a, a lot of the laws of physics but when he turned the thing on it worked and it just went up and it it slammed on the ceiling he lo lost control of it and and he thought it would be a, he thought it would be a good idea. He had the landlady. He was renting a room in a in a in a house, and he had the landlady there. Uh, so he had permission because he said, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen to this thing. And uh, she said, you know, he he tied the kitchen appliances to it and he turned it on again, and it went right up to the ceiling with all the appliances. And 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 then he he did it a third time with uh, a bunch of weights tied to it. 
And he turned it on and it went straight up right through the roof and, and gone, <laughs> gone into outer space, just gone forever, gone. <laughs> and he said he completely forgot that he, he, he forgot about the, the rules of uh, mass and matter. He was, he was forgetting that he was now attaching whatever the weight was, let's say a, a hundred pounds that now it was a hundred pound machine. He wasn't creating any resistance. He was just making it a, a bigger machine. And so it, it, because it was ultimately creating, uh, I don't want to say it because he, I know he wouldn't say it, but uh, so sort of like a, a, a variation in the magnetic field, you know, where uh, it kind of changes the law of attraction. It, it, it kind of pulls the weight to it. So he's, he's onto some really cool stuff and uh, he's got some good, uh, there's some good documentaries on him. Uh, you can find them on YouTube, everyone at home. It's uh, something to really look into. Dr. Searle, it's incredible. Uh, uh, you know, he even in the 60s, he had this project where he was trying to control this thing to fly around the world. And uh, what he did was he 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 uh, had an arrangement of a bunch of people, ham radio operators worldwide. And he was controlling this thing flying around. And he was responsible for a, a, a great deal of UFO sightings in the UK in the 60s. And uh, he was trying to build this thing that was under control he wanted this thing to go under free energy to go up and go around the moon and return within eight minutes but that was his goal and yeah. uh he had uh, a lot of he tried patent it he tried to get a patent for it in the uk and that didn't go so well and he was uh, requested to not make another attempt on it and uh he's even had meetings with uh the united states government and uh and he's got uh, the documentation to prove it and he was he was uh, asked to come over to the United States and and give certain examples of what he accomplished to uh, certain uh, members of our defense and military. And uh, he actually just this year at a um, an energy conference in I believe it was in Denver almost a year ago now. Uh, he actually gave a uh, a live demonstration of this thing uh, in full action, uh, which was the uh, first time done in a long time. Because uh, up until now, it's really just been um, since the 60s, more or less, it's just kind of been a paper model. You know, he's got a lot of plans for these things, but it's really cool stuff because um, he, he, you know, he, he says he, every single house could have one of these and it'll run forever. And you could just, just produce energy with it endlessly. And it, it's no emissions, obviously. It's just a particular arrangement of magnets. So. Well, the amount of money I've spent on heating oil this winter, I'm going oh to have to this guy up. Right, but again, you know, what he says, it, it, it's so true with anyone in energy. It's, it's hard finding an investor for free energy. You know, there's no money to be made, really, for uh, in the business sense, unless you're... That's why they say Weston House pulled out of Tesla's, stopped funding Tesla, because Tesla was like, hey, listen, we can get everybody free energy. And they're like, oh, no, you don't. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. It's just, what good would that do? Right. I mean, um, it's an I personally feel we can be completely wireless here, uh, not even just energy. Every street has telephone poles. There's 10, 20 wires in every line. It's, you know, when you really think about it, it's we're, we're still really tied down. And uh, it's like are, it's telephone wires. And these are it is a, a hundred years ago, you know, 150 years ago. These wires. Well, there's a flip are, side of that, too, Joe. And I'm not really sure how that really plays out, but. Uh, with all the stuff that's flying through the air now, I mean, we have microwaves and uh, you know we have Wi-Fi systems everywhere. People are wondering what that's actually doing to our bodies, you know, because you have all that stuff penetrating us all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, you know, exactly how much in-depth studies have been done. I doubt very few, if any. But we always see those, you know, uh, don't keep your cell phones near your, you know, in your back pocket or in your front pocket if you're a guy because the radiation can kill your sperm or you, it can give you a you know, brain tumor if you have it next yeah. to your head too much and this, that, and the other. So there seems to be a little something floating around, but sometimes I, I, I wonder, you know, what's all this wireless doing to everybody? Well, we've had people here on the show, and a while back we had Melanie Vrichin here from uh, UCatch in uh, Europe, and she was saying the same exact thing, <laughs> that, uh, you know, they used to mention, there used to be discussion about uh, cancer causing, you know, from the cell phone usage and uh, brain tumors and uh, this, that, and the other thing. And and then ultimately that discussion went away. And, uh, you know, there was never any closure to it. And however, 
you know, it, it still exists. And uh, what a lot of people are saying is uh, 10 years from now, we're going to see a lot of problems. And, you know, this is I'm not an expert to to agree with it or not, but it kind of does make sense because uh, these phones are only getting stronger. And I, I know everyone knows that sometimes, you know, your phone rings before it's ringing, like your speakers in your car might go a little crazy or, right. you know, it's, uh, or sometimes, you know, your phone's affecting a TV or a radio and it's not even really doing anything. Uh, I guess we'll find out when we all have eight pound tumors hanging on the side <laughs> of our head. <laughs> well, I guess it won't be so bad if everyone's got one, right? Right. You know, I just don't <laughs> want to be the only guy with the eight pounds. <laughs> you know, as long as we can balance the field. But uh, Dave, Dave, what do we, um, before we get into it, uh, we're getting real close to your UFO conference. It's we're, April's coming up quick on you. Yeah, um, it is. It's been like a mad... <laughs> yeah, how's how's it going? You're getting a good response. Yeah, getting a really good response. Well, you have a great lineup, so We've got a, I'm not shocked at all. A great lineup. Do. Speaking of shock, we have Robert Shock. No, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah who, we, we've got it all. We've why don't got you tell us what's going down. on? Who else do you have coming to? Uh, who else do you have at the event, Dave? We have everybody's favorite UFO historian, Richard Dolan. Very true. Um, we have a guy. We have a guy named Rob Skiba who I follow. He kind of is in the, like, the biblical research crew, but he does this uh, uh, Mount Har Herman uh, Roswell connection, where the in the in the biblical text, the the fallen ones, the fallen angels, landed on Mount Herman. That was the first spot that they landed at, and 180 degrees on the other side of the planet is Roswell, and he has this theory he's worked up. So. That's always interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Nick Redfern, who does all the paranormal books and the Black Eyed Kids and the Men in Black and stuff like that. Oh, so yeah, he's great. He's gonna be, yeah, he's going to be giving a talk on, because everybody's like all jacked up on this. Uh, the Black Eyed Kids is like the new thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, I like and Redfern. So he's he's, gonna really, he's thorough. He does great work. Yeah, he does. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, James Carmen, the guy who just uh, made that new movie, The Hidden Hand, about, you know, alien abduction and stuff like that so he's going to come talk about uh nsa and some some of the other people because he's a, he's part of like the new york contingent around here and when you see his film you'll see some of the like the ufo discussion groups that are around new york and a lot of those people we all know because you know they come to our conference and we've had some of those those people speak so uh james is you know he knew ingo swan and and uh a lot of heavy hitters, so he'll be talking about all kinds of stuff. That sounds great. And I know it's coming up quick. And uh... Oh, yeah. Right. We're in the lull right now. We've got everything set up, and then, you know, another week or so, everybody will be pulling their hair out and running, like, running around like mad people. So <laughs> well, that's, that's the joy of it. That's, <laughs> that's where you get your stories when it's, when it's all done and wrapped up. You say, where did all my hair go? Well, where could – where Dave, can you let everyone know where they could uh, get some more information on that, possibly yeah, tickets? Yeah, I was going to say, fortunately, we have like a Friday night kids out there. Yeah, um, get your tickets because we've, we've broken our on-sale, online ticket sale record, so that's looking good. Awesome. But you can go to uh, www.njufoc.com, and uh, you can click on everybody's name and get their bios and stuff like that, and uh, – we look forward to having you come to the conference. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, everyone, get on there, check it out. It's uh, going to be a great conference as always, and uh, it's coming up quick. It's just a few weeks away now at this point. Well, Dave, what do we got? Do we have anything interesting? Yeah, it gets to be a blur soon. Anything interesting happening in the world of unknown flying objects? I do have some news some of it not so good but uh <laughs> news that we're gonna have to deal with regardless okay so uh, I i've got some yeah i've got some really good uh some good reports that are coming around but uh, as everyone may or may not know uh, uh dr roger lear and dr lear did all the alien implants he he extracted implants from people and and uh, evidently had some you know i i probably got all this Stuff and it's some interesting 
it's some interesting research. But uh, he passed away uh, on March on last Friday, so um, you know we send our condolences to his family. And yeah, absolutely, that, that, that's He's kind a of sad. Great guy. Uh, Roger Lear was in a lot of stuff in, in L.A. Marzoli's watch. Yeah, L.A. Marzoli's watcher series. They they got to be very good friends, and uh, Roger was in every uh, Watchers movie. He was in the last one that I was in, and uh, so yeah, that's going to be kind of a hit. Hopefully, his foundation, you know, keeps up and and keeps forging ahead with this research. Yeah, uh, it was a, then, a big a big loss. Uh, I feel some I've, sad news of sorts. Uh, yeah. Well, we also have the Stan Romanek story. Does everybody know the Stan Romanek story? Um, you know, I don't. I I, I know I know who he is. I, I know who he is, and I've heard some thing. I've heard about him in the news lately, but I don't know what's truth, what's not. Uh, I, I've heard I've heard some negative things about him lately. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's. It didn't sound too good. It, it's muck, you know. I mean, uh, basically, what Stan got popped by the feds for having uh, kitty porn on his computer. Um, for those those of us who you know who've talked with the Roman X and been around the Roman X. Um, we pretty much know Stan's not like one of those type of people, but Stan is, Stan has definitely got something going on. How much he interferes with what's going on is hard to say, but you know, yeah. most people who've been there, you know, he mm-hmm. gives a two hour presentation. That's a pretty much a pants pisser. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I've had some very seasoned people around me, uh, you know, looking at that presentation and it was, a uh, kind of a holy crap you know two hours because they do have some pretty interesting interesting stuff but stan's not one of those type of people and the kind of just note to this is there's a lot of old school ufo guys who don't use a computer online they may have a computer but they keep it offline yeah i mean i actually have one of those type of i have you know computers that i use online computers i don't use online and uh the reason why they don't go online is because they're scared that they're going to get porn downloaded onto their computer. Because evidently, this is just something known that the the feds seem to do. You know, so I had and never even hard considered that. Yeah, and the other thing is, is that Stan's house gets burglarized on a fairly regular base basis. I'm not sure people know that, and they always seem to go after his computer files and his hard files. You know, so uh, that is ridiculous. That yeah, is- I mean, he's been. He's been beaten up down, you know, going down the road and, you know, black vehicles with black windows come out, you know, drag, snatch and beat him to a pulp and throw him back out in the street type now, of what, stuff. So. Help, help me out here. So, well, first first of all, first of all, I'm going to have uh, to touch back on uh, Dr. Lear. A, a terrible loss. Uh, I actually uh, got to speak to him a few times. So oh, nice. And uh, he's a good friend of uh, Dr. Jay's, who uh, good friend of the program. And uh, actually, I spoke to him a few times. I believe it was on the third phase of the moon radio uh, here on freedomslips.com Studio A, Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Now, Dr. Lear, man, uh, great guy, great guy, um, passion driven, um, very thorough. It's a, it's a, it's a sad loss uh, because he was really uh, kind of in a field on his own, per se. Uh, it was really... Uh, he was the, the head of his class there, and he was, he was the expert with uh, removing these implants, whatever these things were. Uh, I, I really don't even know. Uh, and there seems to be a, a, really a fair incredible. amount of controversy on that, that end of things as well. Yeah, I, 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 I've heard it, but I mean, some of, some of them are really weird. But now with, with Stan there, uh, you know, it's really glad, I'm glad <laughs> for you to hear that up there. But, you know, these are the same things that make people not want to speak up, you know? Uh, but now, why why rough him up so much? Uh, why not just, uh, just uh, have, you know, uh, silence someone instead of uh, really harass them pretty good, you know? Um, would, uh, you know, th- th- what people, most people don't realize is that there's a pathology to, to ufology. I mean, you there's, there are things that, in patterns that we see and one of the patterns that you see is um there's a sexual component to it and sometimes it's all kind of seems to manifest around you know the same thing wendell stevens got popped you know, one 
twice for you know uh, uh, underage girls but you know you don't know how people are presenting themselves at conferences you know uh, you don't know if it's a setup or whatever but you have him you know there's been people within dr greer's circle said there's you know lots of uh you know young boys running around the compound and he's siphoning money off sirius and and you know uh doing a lot of stuff that you know i don't really feel like mentioning on radio but there's a lot of cases and those are just ones that are up in the front that have this strange component to it so it's like when you see it you don't you know you kind of wait on it you wait for it because it'll usually be around some of these you know some of the big time stuff the guys are really kind of kicking over stones to a certain extent and whether they you know it's it always seems like it starts out as a good thing and it just turns into a mess later on but you just kind of sit back and you watch how it ha you watch how it unfolds and you'll get this type of reaction so you you kind of expect it and when you don't get it it's more unexpected you're like oh this is interesting but this is not out of the realm of how this field runs wow well it's really sad to hear uh because i know uh, stan he's he has a family and uh it's i can't even imagine just the harassment alone never mind uh such stiff accusations you know it's uh yeah and there's a lot of people coming and going in that house and 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 you know it's a, yeah it's, it's I, I feel I, bad. My, my first thing is, and i'm pretty hard ass i have to admit when it comes to, to ufo stuff and I, you know you have to be and that's just is that Stan just doesn't come off like that to me. He's just and most been everybody exact everybody around Stan knows exactly what I'm talking about. He just doesn't really come off like something like that. And it yeah. And he's been there's a lot of stuff going on around the Romanek, so well I know uh I know he's got a lot of paranormal action. Uh, it, it people really don't seem to be arguing that fact too much. Um you well, the thing is neither one of them were ever into this stuff, and you know, Lisa kind of caught Stan at the trailing or you know when this stuff was starting to happen so you've got somebody completely outside the picture coming in and they're ex seeing and experiencing all this stuff in real time and and they'd really have some bizarre stuff even some of that like uh, you know uh, Stan was supposed to go in for like a broken something or other and they're gonna he had his foot in one of those metal cages with all the screws in your legs you know yeah the, he, I guess he was supposed to go in for an operation Woke up the next day after one of these incidences, had like six little red dots down his leg, but the cage was missing. His bone was perfectly put together. He was walking around and he has the tape recorder in his pocket when he goes to the doctor. And the doctor's like, so you woke up this morning and the cage was off your leg. And, you know, he's like, I can't find any break in the bone. And he's like, maybe you should call Ghostbusters. <laughs> 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 you know, but it's just like there's a lot of bizarre stuff going around that case. So it's hard. Yeah. yeah. It it's uh it's it's terrible. That's how I feel about it. It really is. But I mean, honestly, it does make me uh, want to be a little more cautious. I, I had never considered someone intentionally implanting uh, something like that onto my computer. Um, well, I've I just worry I've about people erasing things. To be honest with you, when smartphones first came out, I used to get a kick because i could do like my ufo research on the phone on, right there and i mean it was better than having a computer pretty much because i could take it anywhere and and you know keep at it but uh every now and then you'll step into an area and i had a couple blackberry phones and i won't say the area where i stepped into but as soon as i made the download the phone goes ding ding and then <laughs> battery goes supernova and you're like what just happened there and then you get your new phone your new smartphone and you're like I'm gonna go back to that site again, and you go back to that site, or, or and, and you, you go, you do the download, you find what you find something you don't expect to find. You're like, oh, there it is, bang! You download it real quick, and the phone goes ding, ding, and the battery <laughs> goes over again, and you're like, all right, well, I'm not gonna do this anymore on these phones. <laughs> so. Well, you know, like I said, I, I, I just always, uh, I, I, my only concern is having things erased from my computers. Uh, I guess I should consider uh, people acting a little maliciously, a little more than than I do. Yeah, it's um, putting stuff onto your computer that you have to worry about because they can put stuff on your computer from stuff you you know you have no clue about. 
Yeah, I, I very rarely even consider that. And so thank you for reminding me about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm afraid at this point again, the they've got us coming and going. They pretty I much know, know everyone. I, I think that's why I kind of just gave up on it anyway. You know, um, I, I've, I've already tried getting, you know, the best security I can. And uh, it just seems like every time someone gets through to my computer, they're really just uh, toying around with it. You know, I, I don't understand uh what people do when they break into computers but uh, i've had mine hacked in a few times and uh emails it always goes through the emails it always comes through the emails first and uh the last the last time it happened to me i actually got a message uh, actually google called me and told me that uh my email had been breached and uh what was really strange about it is they they actually traced it as, as back as as far as they could and uh, the activity and uh, the report that came back was that uh, it seems that no one was really doing anything. They were just monitoring and, and looking and looking at emails. Uh, and it had been going on up until that point for up to up to 21 days. And they were able to track it back to the Houston area, Houston, Texas. And uh, and that was the end of it. And then I actually had to get a whole new account. It was, uh, it was a lengthy ordeal. It was a real pain in the butt, to be honest with you. I was cutting up with Linda Howe because Linda and I have like horrifically long passwords in order to get into any of our stuff. And it's just like, you're like, but if somebody, <laughs> somebody hasn't, somebody hasn't cracked that code in a really long time. But so I'm thinking whatever I've done, I've done right because it's been a long time since my, my, my PC has gotten hacked, but they really have to go through some, some to do it. Well, I, I hope I'm done with it too, because uh, it's it's real BS. But uh, it's when things get deleted, it's a real pain too. You know, it it really is. I don't understand it. Um, but uh, hopefully, it's that's not. the good thing about all the cloud stuff now. So you can store all your stuff on the cloud. And if your your and if your hard drive takes a takes a dive somehow and you can't hose it and get your information, it's still sitting in the cloud. That's one one good thing. The, the bad thing is that whoever's running the cloud's got all your information in the cloud. So. <laughs> right. Am I so, fear is something got you on, that, on that end? It's, that's a big fear of mine. And you know, getting a message saying, you know, uh, we lost everything. Sorry about that. <laughs> You know. And I, I wonder about that too, because I think, you know, most you know, people. Hey, are just, sorry about that, you know, but really. Most people are heads in the clouds are like, oh, it's in a cloud somewhere, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> no, it's on the ground somewhere. And if something like if they get a bad lightning strike or something, all the information goes. And it's just like, well, what happens when the cloud goes down and everybody gets real quiet here? <laughs> well, before we get to the break, uh, Dave, and uh, while we still have UFOs fresh on mind here, uh, I want to ask you, there has been. Uh, I would say a lack in quality UFO claims over the last, uh, I'm going to say, in my personal opinion, like two months, I really haven't heard anything really astonishing. Uh, yeah, nothing, it's you know, it, it is, does this, in your experience, do, or is, is it a, does it go in phases a lot? Because, I'm, I mean, go. I'm even speaking worldwide. It does go in phases, and we know it. It's funny because the East Coast gets hot in the winter time the the or excuse me in the summertime it'll it'll heat up and in the midwest it seems like um the latter months and so it's it's we kind of look for those you know around october kind of starts getting quiet but you can get a little action and but once it starts getting cold we don't really get a lot of action on the east but it seems like uh uh, and we can go into it when we come back from the break. I mean, there's there's some stuff going on, but by and large, any anything really, any good decent sightings have been kind of thin. And there's there's just one going around, and it's saying, you know, see this video. It's being deleted from the internet. Blah 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 blah. And it's these guys, and they roll out of this car, and it's, they get there's this UFO in the cloud, and they zoom up on it and oh, yeah, start shooting this balls one. down. And it, and it's a Brazilian TV commercial, but like everybody's still passing around. You're like. People, this is here. Here's the link. This is, it's a commercial. You know, I but think I'm, I saw that like two years ago. Could, could I, it be possible? It, I think like it maybe was big a, a couple. It ago. was big a couple weeks ago. Everybody was going crazy on it. It was just like no. I almost know. feel like I really saw that thing like two years ago. Maybe it was just something similar. I keep telling myself yeah. I saw it. One, one CGI looks like the next CGI, but you know, you, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll give everybody a tip. 
you'll rarely see a, a UFO, like a flying saucer, shooting stuff down to the ground, like in ball lightning form, or, you know, or just, I've seen them shoot, you know, beams down to the ground, but that, this ain't that, so. You've seen, you you've seen, that, you you've seen beams? You saw beams get shot down? Yeah, there's a couple good ones. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Allison Cruz has one, and uh, it's, it's yeah, uh, your folks laser beam but you got to check this out it was like one of the first ones uh, uh i stumbled across but it's a good video i think i've gonna, seen that one. we're gonna have to get to it in a minute guys everyone hang in there don't go too far and we'll be back in a few minutes for a little more action Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Researchers on a Mission Radio. Hosted tonight, as always, Dave Sonnet, Joe Kiernan, Tim C. producing the programming in the back over there. Hi, Tim. Hi, Dave. How's it going? Joe. How's it going? I'm, I'm glad everyone came back to the show, including my partners here. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about some good stuff there. Uh, a lot of good things that uh, we were getting into. But before we do, uh, I'd like to remind everyone this is the world's largest listener-supported radio station. Uh, we have excellent programming. Uh, we have many different shows. I think we're over uh, have over seventy shows between both studios. Uh, I recommend everyone uh, please finding your way to freedomslips.com. Uh, you'll find a lot of wonderful things there, and uh, likewise, you'll find a lot of fantastic people in the chat room. A lot of interesting conversations. Uh, uh, keep in mind there there are two programs running concurrently on Studio A and Studio B. So it might take you a moment to discern from one conversation to another on there, but uh, nonetheless, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, platform to have uh, for live communication and interaction with your hosts. And it's a great way to uh, ask your questions. If you go there and you, uh, you could type your questions to the, uh, the host of the programs, if you uh, do all your wording in all capital letters and uh, more often than not, the hosts really like to uh, to get a good response for you. So we, we like to get to those questions, including this program here. Uh, Tim, Tim, my man, yes, Tim. Uh, we were talking about uh, the seed pack, and right. um, and you know what? I'm just going to ask you can can you te can you tell everyone at home about the wonderful seed pack? Uh, yeah, because I know it's it's your it's your thing. I know you're in love with it right now. Uh, well, can it's you real tell simple, us about actually. It? Um, you can just go to freedomslips.com and click on the support us link. Um, and basically, you can you could give sixty, hundred, two hundred dollars, and you, you know per the amount that you actually donate, you get a different package. Um, includes, let's see here, tons of seeds, thousands of seeds, and. Uh, we get, almost, you get a bonus almost. DVD showing uh, survival uh, DVD, which includes 900 documents about bug out bags, clothing, combat, uh, communications, all sorts of things that uh, you may need when the S hits the fan. Got everything. <laughs> and uh, but um, 
Yeah, it's pretty simple to do it. You just pay with PayPal. It's real simple, actually. So right. it's like it's point and click. Right. It's fan it's fantastic. I really do recommend that everyone has one of these. It's it's uh it's one of those things that everyone even knows that they need one. But <laughs> non GMO and you need to get motivated on it. No pesticides. I know, but it's, it's fantastic. You keep the, the seeds, uh, if you refrigerate them, you keep them up to fifteen years. If you freeze them, you put them in the freezer, you uh, they could last twenty five years. And it gives you instructions on how to do that, how to keep That's them, true. how to how to, you know, properly but it gives you everything. I mean, it, that manual uh, with the 900 uh, documents on the DVD, I mean, it really tells you everything, how to filtrate water, how to there's irrigate a lot of people who There's a lot of people who keep out bug out bags around nowadays. I was, I, I was a young kid who cuts hair and I overheard him saying, talking about his bug out bag. And I was just like, hmm. No kidding. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, there's I'm, enough shows on TV about uh, the apocalypse and... <laughs> and all that, you know, I'm preppers and whatnot. The preppers, so it's, stuff. it's pretty popular. Well, you know, ultimately, people really only prepared for like a day or two, uh, even in their own house. You know, <laughs> people yeah. really, uh, well, at least the people I know. Yeah. Well, look at what happens when up here. Long. I know in the <laughs> east, if if they're expecting five inches of snow, the uh, you go to the supermarket, you can't even get a parking spot. Right on. People right on. Freak out. Well, they said in the in that last big storm that they had here in Jersey, and I mean it, it that waffled us. I, I don't think I've ever seen New Jersey take a, uh, an ice hit like that before in my life. It was when Sandy, Sandy came up. I mean, it just wreaked havoc everywhere. But they said that the preppers who had you know stored up all this food were the were the uh, the saving grace of everything because. They were able to help feed everybody until everybody was able to get to the stores because, I mean, all of us lost the electricity for like, you know, a week or, you know, two weeks. So, Wow, that really is. I, I, for, I forget how bad that is, but uh, you really lost power for a week. Yeah, and I was wow. fortunate because I was, I was dating a girl at the time and it literally her house was the only house in her neighborhood that had electricity. I don't know how that happened, but I was just like, sweet. You know? I got lucky because I got gas <laughs> that day before. I, I had just filled my gas tank the day before, and I just decided to ration it. But people Man, are freaking out about wild. gas. Yeah. I think hey, you can see a lot of the people on Facebook, and they're like, they needed help, and you wanted to get out there to help them. But, I mean, you could literally barely get off your street because, I mean, there was trees down across every roadway, everywhere. It was, you know, it was a madhouse. Yeah. I forget how bad it gets like that up there. I really do. Uh, especially... I think we we get pretty lucky down here, at least in my town. It's a, you know a fairly new town. I think the oldest building in my town is like from 1950. It really isn't that old at all. But a lot of our uh, a lot of our power lines and everything that like we were talking about earlier, everything's underground and fair and fairly new. So uh, we usually fare fare pretty well. The only thing that really gets us all the time uh, is just flooding. You know if uh, if if Water's not soaking through too good. Everything starts shorting out. You do um, get a lot of flooding down there, don't you? Yeah, we do. You know, because it, ultimately my whole county is like averages like about six feet over sea level. So when it's raining really hard and ultimately a lot of the, the, the street drain pipes for uh, just water runoff uh, ultimately gets piped out towards the ocean. And if it's high tide... The water is not going to flow out because the the water level is higher than that pipe, you know. So, water won't drain off the street. Reservoir basin types. I mean, if you if you dig down a few feet, you're you're at sea level, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's too. That's very unfortunate, and I I, I feel for you because uh, I've been flooded out several times in the past five years up here, in uh, places I've lived and places I've, I that I work, and oh, what a nightmare. Right, it's it's the yeah, it's the the flooding in the water that really gets us down here. Um, I haven't really gone through any big windstorms, but in regards to the electric, it's it's the flooding that always gets us. And and when that happens, those trans uh, generators, whatever those suckers are, those things blow up like bombs, man. Those things, like, yeah, you, wow, you hear those things go off, and the, the light shows are usually pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah. <laughs> And you hear that. I was about to uh, say, if you've ever been to California during an earthquake, afterwards you could just sit there off the off your balcony or whatever, and you could just watch the transformers go. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, crap. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I find beauty in everything, you know. <laughs> Those well, wildfires are pretty beautiful also in certain uh, contexts. Didn't you have wildfires down there in the Carolinas, Joe? Yeah, years actually, back? yeah, we had one uh, right here in my town. It was actually uh, maybe about 60 homes here in my town got lost. It was it was really it was pretty darn close. Um, and it virtually happened overnight where I woke up in the morning and you, you really couldn't see that far. It looked like it was like really foggy, but it was smoke. I mean, you could smell it. It was uh, you, you shut the door. I opened the door and shut it right away. And I, I was like, what the hell is going on? And uh, I put the TV on because I was obviously late for work as usual. I was about to fly out of the door and uh, there was a big wildfire. I, w I wasn't even able to go where I wanted to go. But what was so wild about it was when the height of this uh, this firestorm was happening here because of the the winds that were swirling off the ocean here it was taking like uh, charcoals let's say pieces of well i would say like from a campfire literally pieces of wood like three to six inches long like sticks were just dropping some of them still kind of you know ambers you know where they were catching fire because uh, a lot of people down here uh, their flower beds around their houses aren't always mulch. Sometimes they decorate them with like a, a pine straw. There's a, a lot of pine trees down here. So uh, pr people are pretty utilitarian. <laughs> uh, so uh, unfortunately... Yeah, we use wood chips these... up here. You guys use the pine needles down there. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, and if you had these pine needles and you were near by this fire, really, those people lost their houses or put down to People who had like stone gardens, their houses are still there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I see luckily, that. Though, no you know? yeah, yeah, but that's really what it boiled down to. You know, that's the sad part is uh, people were trying to hose their houses down or whatever. But you just you have six, eight inches thick of uh, three, four year old pine needles piled up around the size of your house. It's it's. it's, you know, it's I it's, even heard it's some tender. strange theories. Start a fire with. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever find out what caused those fires? Because I mean, even up here in, in uh, New York, we, we heard some, or I did anyhow, I heard some strange theories about what could have caused those fires no, down it, there. No, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up because I was following it pretty strong for a while. Uh, they had a few leads. Uh, you know, they tracked it back to like the first home that was lost and they tried to get into it. But ultimately, uh, no, no. And I've, I've even followed up on it in recent times. They really, really don't have anything on that. And what's strange about it is, uh, I know both of you have heard me mention it before. This was in this was this started in those Carolina Bays, those those circular unknown happenings here in my county. That was definitely the uh, yeah, theory that, I was talking about. Yeah, this is it. it that that uh, there's um, it's you know, uh, Tim, you know, right across the street from my house is part of those uh, protected forests. It's it's called a forest, but there's really not so many trees. It's more of these. Uh, they look like meteor uh, craters is what they look like. Uh, they're fairly shallow, and there's probably right, a, a right. thousand or two, two thousand of them in my county. And uh, right. they're, they're now uh, a protected land. It's uh, called the uh, – there's a Carolina Bay Trust uh, that owns these things. It's a, a federal association, but they now encompass 10,000 acres that they can't even touch these things. But I have articles from every – uh, major university over the last hundred years that have done studies on these things and and literally not one university could come up with the same theory as another university and and uh, half of these top universities all Ivy League all of these papers and studies were done on behalf and request of NASA um, and this is where I got a lot of my info on the elements pertaining to these craters and that they have uh, an unreasonable amount of nano diamonds and microspherals and even the uh, as funny as it is the buckyballs. Are you familiar with buckyballs, Dave? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not not the etch. <laughs> the, the, you know, these, these little <laughs> uh, these tiny little microspheral things, but uh, uh, they're usually only found with meteor impacts and uh, high levels of iridium and all these things that are, are trace elements that are pretty customary to in impact. However, there's no impact to be found and they're, it, they're all so shallow and um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And, um, and for those who don't know Buckminster Fuller, 
you may want to look up that name because he was an interesting character and came up with a lot of cool stuff. Thank you. I couldn't remember that guy's name. Well, that is the area, Tim, where uh, those fires sprung up. And uh, it might have been accidental. Uh, I mean, it was a fair day. It was it was April, but it was just a regular spring day. Uh, you know, no ele no electric storms. It wasn't a drought or anything like that. Uh, maybe it was some just you know, some people in the woods. But you know, the the difference is uh, like these kinds of areas. Uh, I I really don't want to go for a walk through there because. This is this is really where you're going to find the poisonous snakes and spiders. You, you know, uh, we have all of those here, but <laughs> not so much in the communities. But you know, and crocodile, uh, crocodile, alligators. Uh, you know, uh, these are those areas. So uh, it's you really don't see a lot of uh, wood hikers. You know, uh, we <laughs> really not the thing to do around here. It's more of a uh, people walk the beach. You know. Uh, but uh, it was it was a pretty wild fire, man. It was pretty pretty scary because uh, at one point we were uh, on the fence on uh, on getting out of Dodge because it, it was growing so fast. We were really just saying like we really only have one more road to get out of town, you know. And if it started heading over, I mean, I figured the worst case scenario I could go into the water to the ocean, right? <laughs> You know, okay. worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I was all right, you know. I was just two. I was living at the time. I was just two blocks off the water, so I was like, ah, if I get cornered, I guess I'll be okay. <laughs> it's a long pier, you know. I go <laughs> pretty far. Go for a swim, save your life. <laughs> That's it. But uh, I don't I actually don't even go in the ocean anymore, man. I've seen way too many of those animals that live in the ocean. The sharks. Uh, That's right. You were telling me about that. Yeah. I, I, uh, and I, I've seen way too many, and I don't think it, I, if I surely knew how large sharks are and how close they really come to shore. I mean, I haven't seen monsters, but I mean, I've seen sharks. My, you know, six foot, uh, maybe seven. Uh, and I'm waist deep, you know, so that's really scary. That uh, they could just take a kid, you know. I don't know that's how they don't. I don't like because I see them all the time. That's funny, Joe. I, it's it's funny you should say that because I was talking to a guy, a big surfer guy today, and I was making that statement because they did some sort of program, but they're flying helicopters over like beaches of the East Coast and mm -hmm. beaches off Australia and, and whatnot. And we're like, wherever the surfers and the people were swimming, there was like a whole row of sharks just stacked up behind everybody. And you're like, man, that's a lot of sharks. And there's like every single swim spot where humans were, the sharks weren't all that far behind everybody in the surf and you're like hmm. <laughs> well you know it, it the last time uh was last year it we were down there at the beach and there was like a let's say just 10 feet from where the water's hitting your toes it just in two three feet of water there's just fish going crazy jumping out of the water and you know everyone's tourists are, are saying you know wow look at how cool it is wow they're trying to go over there and i said listen folks i'm telling you there's there's probably sharks over there and, you know, no one was really listening to me. They all want to take pictures. And so they're, they're wandering in there. And it's really what it was. There was probably about 10 sharks that were like three or four feet long. And uh, it scared everyone. And, and what people don't realize is, you know, it's only a three-foot shark, but that will mess you up if that thing grabs a hold of your leg. It will, it will mess you up. Yeah, I don't want to lose a toe. I don't care. No, no. So uh, I don't even mess around with the water anymore. I, I really don't. Um, I mean, <laughs> because if you go on the pier – that's what people are catching all day long are sharks and you know you're fishing while you're watching your kids swimming it makes no sense at all in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> makes no sense but uh before i stray too far i really wanted to talk about someone i wanted to uh, as as you guys both know i i really do love my uh my history facts and i'm going to try to bring some out but this is this is a guy who actually uh tim uh you saw uh, I'm going to speak uh, about Giordano Bruno from the 1500s. Tim, you were telling me before the show you saw uh, a mention of this gentleman on a TV program recently. Yeah, um, Cosmos, the show uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson on, I believe right. it's Nat Geo. Um, I think it was the first episode, actually. And they had, he had a whole long uh, uh, seg well, segment, really, cool. on just Giordano Bruno and Very his and his beliefs and theories and how he was, uh, well, Pretty much 
they they uh they burnt him. Oh they yeah. They, they just <laughs> yeah. murdered that guy. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, then, you know, not like 10 years later, they said, hey, oh, by the way, yeah. he was right. <laughs> right, right. Um, by the way. It, and, it, was, it was a real sketchy thing because it started at the end. You know, <laughs> he, he, he was friends with Galileo and, you know, and, and this whole crew. And they pretty much had to watch it happen. And, you know, he got, he got burnt alive right in the center of their town. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, the whole family. They they really didn't the and I say they the the Inquisition who was brought up by charges of the, by the Inquisition, uh, but uh, they really did him dirty, man. They they nailed his tongue. <laughs> they nailed well, his tongue. They so he tortured him for seven years before yeah. he, even before they put him out of his misery by yeah. burning him to death. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, well, uh, I mean, uh, let, let me explain. Let me explain to everyone at <laughs> home. <laughs> if, if you're unaware so, of, of the Catholic speaking, Church is a rough, <laughs> rough group back then. Right. right. <laughs> there's, from what I understand, they're still a pretty rough group. Like, yeah. I, I understand. I understand. Uh, the nailing of the tongue, really. The burning, I understood. <laughs> but you know, you know uh, he was he was an interesting guy. You know, he was a very smart man, no doubt about it. Uh, he was uh, he was a priest. He became a priest early in life. Uh, he did a, a lot of studying. Um, he he did he really did believe in God. However, uh, against the church, he was he was you know w one of the reasons they really think he was brought up on charges was because again he was one of the people that be believed the sun was the center of the universe, and it it really wasn't just that uh, that got him in trouble. Now. Early in life, when he had initially become a priest, and he was just uh, very diligent in his studies, and he was a quite accomplished young man. As a matter of fact, uh, in the 14, I'm sorry, in the 1580s, he had published a book, and it was called The Art of Memory. And what was really cool about it was uh, he really impressed everyone, you know, all of all these superiors at the, the churches and everywhere. And he was uh, able to do pretty incredible things that people were not able to understand. And he was trying to write a book, uh, basically letting everyone know the, the way he goes about it. And uh, what he would accomplish in this is, uh, as crazy as it sounds, folks, uh, he believed that he was able to uh, more or less tap into uh, a, a different uh, a different wavelength in the mind and uh, and attain a lot of uh, lost history uh, the 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 true secrets of the universe uh, channel yeah more or less this is what he was saying and what was so incredible was he was before the Inquisition, okay, when he was just in within the church, he was acknowledged for this. They allowed him to publish this book, and they were so impressed by it, he actually got the chance to go to Rome and meet the Pope and explain and give a presentation. And he did so, and uh, the Pope was impressed. And um, on a side note, he even says that he... He, uh, the Pope accepted his his theories on the lost secrets of Noah's Ark. Uh, I don't know what that was because that that book is lost to us. Uh, however, he presented it to the Pope, and uh, the Pope did not have him killed for this. Um, it, it was, seemed pretty convincing, uh, convincing to him. Uh, it wasn't until a few years later. Uh, when a control freak in Venice hired him to come and uh, teach him this art of memory. And uh, when he came to do so, it was just a trap. And this Venetian uh, held him prisoner. And he ultimately had to give this prisoner up to the Inquisition because uh, by this point, the Inquisition came down hard on him because what he had gotten trouble for initially was he had a book by Erasmus uh, that was found in his like toiletry area, and uh, it was a banned book at the time uh, about uh, a mathematical universe, and um, and that was a book that you had to answer to the Inquisition for. 
So he ran for a, a great deal, um, going from country to country, and um, he just didn't want to give up uh, what he believed. He believed that he had a solid understanding, and uh, and he was known for saying that his his understanding would be uh, accepted if if he would have a patient mind from every religion. It, it uh, and intertwined with all of them. Now, the tough thing about Bruno is, as uh, Tim was mentioning, how they burnt him alive. Bruno, usually when the Inquisition got you, uh, they usually, well, more important, most people, if they have a chance to get out of there, they say whatever they can. Uh, they don't care the embarrassment. And let's be honest, no one wants any kinds of torture at all. Uh, none. For, for me, however, uh, <laughs> the, the, no the, uh, I'm just no a feeling, time. man. You know what I mean? This guy <laughs> get his, his tongue nailed, and you know, I mean, like you're, you're burning me, dude. You know, Rack time. you know what I mean? Like, what's what's the point, man? Well, it's uh, a good thing they weren't Sicily because they'd probably have the necktie. You know, it, <laughs> it's probably a regional thing. You know what I'm <laughs> well, you, you know, he. He was um he was set in his ways and and rightfully so. Uh, he was one of the few in history that stuck to his guns. He really That's stuck to his guns, and right. and, I, and I'll and I'm going to get into that because right. usually the longer cases when you were uh, being tortured through the Inquisition, some cases went a few months, some went three or four months where people were tortured routinely. And uh, and they ended up dying is why it only went three or four months. <laughs> Bruno, we know he was tortured at least 18 times, like specifically 18 planned meetings to torture his butt and to get him to recant uh, whatever his charges were. Because I want to mention that his official charges and all of the transcripts of the hearings and everything, because during the Inquisition, even during all the torture sessions, everything had to everything was recorded. Uh, they recorded everything, and it's so tragic that I've actually read a few of them that you could see the the, the scribe or whoever was writing while these tortures were going on. That you could see as they go from one page to the next. The longer it goes, the worse their handwriting gets. It's they get really shaky and. Uh, you could tell they're they're having a hard time being there. Never mind writing it. So, and that's the person writing. You know, <laughs> that's not the guy with the nail in his tongue. Now, Bruno, on the other hand, when after he was in Venice for a few months and he went to the Roman Inquisition and they took him to Rome, as Tim mentioned, they held him for seven years, and he had ample opportunities. And multiple times he was given multiple, I mean, probably almost every day he was given a pen and a paper for him to at least write his apology, it, it, giving him all of these chances. And he wouldn't write it. He wouldn't take any guests. He didn't want anyone to try to persuade him from what he believed to be the truth. And ultimately, it came down to a new pope coming in and, and they were telling the pope, you know, we have Bruno, he's been here, and Pope basically says, how long, what, almost eight years, and what's the problem? Why, uh, he's not telling you anything, be done with him, you know? Uh, why are we housing him for seven, eight years? And and uh, and they did away with him. Uh, they just gave him one last chance. He said no, they brought him to town square, uh, tied him up to the pole, nailed his tongue, lit him on fire, and um, they made it a public spectacle. Uh, it was is absolutely tragic. Uh, now, <laughs> now for my man Bruno here, he um, he's got a few good things going for him these days. <laughs> he he's got a very very large crater on the on the back side of the moon. They can't even give him the good side, um, but they put him on That's the back the side of the there. moon. Yeah, yeah, he's got he the, the large. Well, I think it's the largest crater. It's a twenty-two kilometer, twenty-two kilometer crater. So that's a pretty darn big crater. All right. And uh, he's got that named after him. So he's got that going for him. But uh, you know, besides the program that uh, Tim is mentioning, I'd like to mention that he's also acknowledged by SETI, as uh, Dave and I were talking earlier uh, before the show. Uh, and SETI is the the, uh, the the league or group uh, for, it's a, an acronym for Search 
for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, it's, it's great that they acknowledge them, and I'll tell you why, is uh, Bruno not only believed that the sun was the center of uh, the Earth went around the sun, but he believed that our sun was uh, just like every other star we see. It was just one among an infinite amount, uh, and this infinite amount of stars has planets just like ours. And, uh, and more importantly, what most likely really got people fired up was he didn't just suggest the fact that there was life elsewhere. He was adamant that there had to be uh, not just life, but intelligent life. All kinds of uh, almost an infinite amount as far as you go, because Bruno also put out uh, more or less uh, the quantum physics theory of relativity. He was he was arguing the theories of space and time were one, which was astonishing for the 1500s in a time when you can't even uh, you have to be very careful who you even speak these uh, thoughts with. Um, you know, it's very hard to bounce ideas off of someone when they when they're willing to sell you out. Collectively, the world really at that point had just found out that the Earth was round a hundred years prior. So, yeah. I know, but um, <clears throat> but I think that's more of a modern tale. You know, and, and I only say this because, you know, we were we were measuring eclipses and and we we you know we were able to see the Earth's shadow cast on the moon, and uh, we're able to to see this crescent shape and through eclipses and and although it was it was more or less lost in time uh, throughout time. You know, these these are uh, measurements Egyptians were doing, but even even oh, told totally even Ptolemy, to you told had them, but <clears throat> but these these writings were all gone until this time of Bruno and uh, the generation before him, where they were uh, vigorously translating all of these old found texts, and most of them came from the fall of Constantinople, which was the old Constantine Library. It's why we see a large influx of them, and right. Uh, right after the 1450s. Uh, but, you know, Bruno was one of these dudes, and uh, I'd really like to get into it here because uh, before, you know, sometimes I know I come across as someone who speaks negatively on the church. However, I was raised Roman Catholic, and, <laughs> uh, and, and I did go to my mass every week in Sunday school and... I've even been awarded a medal for my studies from a cardinal at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. So right. I think I am allowed to do this. <laughs> so with that said, and I hope I don't so get it. good. I'll have somebody else to wail on, <laughs> on the Catholic Church with you. <laughs> now, my, my church uh, that I was raised in, uh, the Vatican in Rome, was uh, kind enough in the year of 1942 <laughs> to address uh, the issue of the trial and execution of my man, Bruno. And uh, it was, the commission was headed by Cardinal Giovanni Mercati. And uh, he did so because he was the gentleman supposedly responsible for discovering a number of the lost documents relating to Bruno's trial. And uh, I want to just mention that until this day, we, nobody has seen these uh, outside of the Vatican. Um, hey, do you mind if I jump in here real quick? No, I don't mind at all. Isn't it true? I, I'm, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure the Pope at the time was canonized in the 30s, the 1930s. This is the Pope responsible, more or less. Or Anyway, I'll say it was on his watch when uh, the yes. Inquisition was in full swing mm -hmm. and during the, uh, the burning of Bruno. So yeah, they, they that's that's the the church's answer. They 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 saint the guy. Yeah, he was made a saint. That's right. right. The 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 man who sent him to his execution is currently a saint. That is correct. Uh, so in 1942, Giovanni Mercati, a cardinal, discovered a bunch of his lost documents, which no one has seen, and uh, he made a public statement about them, and. Um, he felt the church was totally in the right, and uh, they did nothing wrong. So, 
Uh, that that was fine, and uh, then they, these challenges were met again in the year 2000, when Cardinal Sedano declared Bruno's death a sad episode. But, and I quote, despite his regret, he defended Bruno's prosecutors, maintaining that the Inquisitors had the desire to serve freedom and promote the common good and did everything possible to save his life. <laughs> End quote. Um, Bizarre. They were probably spitting on him so that he wouldn't well, burn Well, what part of the nailing of the tongue is saving anything? <laughs> like, I just think we, what you, you can't say we did everything we could to save his life. Uh, but I guess you can. I guess you can say that. Um, I, I wish I could see these documents. You know, uh, a lot of people do. I understand why we're not seeing them. They're probably oh, horrible. They're probably really terrible. Uh, there's probably not one good looking image out of any of it relating to the church, and you're not going to see them. Um, now, Pope John Paul II did quasi make an apology for all the prominent philosophers and scientists that uh, had terrible ends due to the Inquisition. Uh, well, that's good enough for me. Yeah, but it, it was kind of vague, you know. <laughs> it wasn't a kind of got your tongue sort of thing, but yeah. You know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. My bad. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so, back in in, uh, in full circle here, what's cool about uh, SETI is uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is that starting in 1995, they've actually been issuing an annual trophy. Uh, for uh, the person most deserving in that field, making a, a significant contribution to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which I've nominated Dave Smith for this year, actually. And, uh, second that. and that trophy is actually called the Bruno. And uh, it's for our man uh, Giordano Bruno, which is, which is pretty darn cool uh, that he's you know, get, getting the respect still today. And you know, not just uh, for a show on the cosmos, for his his theories on the universe, uh, but you know, also from uh, UFO communities too, uh, because you know he he was he really did believe. Uh, not it really to him it wasn't really a, a belief. It, he just felt it the the having it intelligent life elsewhere. It had to be. Uh, it wasn't so much a theory to to him the way. He thought he thought everything was in particular proportions universally, so therefore it had to be. Can I add to that? No. <laughs> I'm not going to. Yes, that. of course, That's of course. No, How rude. On, go How rude. Go ahead. Well, go ahead. Uh, not only the intelligent life aspect, the alien worlds, he, he had uh, a many worlds theory, which more or less correlates with the multidimensional theory. From the way he described it, the way he wrote about it, um, it really it, it elaborates on the quantum mechanics uh, as, as we know it today, as the theories are today, that the possibility of there being an infinite number of universes as well, which is not to mention amazing for you know, anyone of antiquity to, to have that, to, to be able to grasp it, but to come up with that thought is just beyond. Well, you guys also have to remember that Nachmanides in the 1300s wrote a white paper on uh, dimensions mm -hmm. just just by reading Genesis. And his p white paper is our present model. So these guys Excellent. were, you know, and, I, and I've always wondered, and it was probably because it was a couple hundred years before the Inquisition, but I always wondered how guys like him didn't get persecuted in the same way. But, you know, if they're writing in a different language or something like that and the authorities weren't able to read it, then maybe they had something up on it and, a lot well, of that, you know, a lot the, of that's code. The printing anyway. press wasn't around in the 1300s. That might have had something to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it wasn't spread as much. I mean, Giordano was dangerous to the Catholic Church in that time because people, not that everybody could read, but everybody was spread a Catholic lot quicker. Church. Yeah. He was, he was trying to say, in regards to the sun, he was trying to say not so much that the earth went around the sun. What he was trying to, I, my personal opinion is what, you know, probably what nailed his tongue to the post was he, <laughs> he was trying to say that 
religion was changed either. that God God made the sun and the sun uh, the sun is an example of God um, you know we we see it in you know everything here on earth like we see plants that follow the sun and in all of these things and and he was trying to argue that it was it used to be we were worshiping god's son in the sky not so much god's son a person and i think one of the biggest because that's what that's what that's heresy, what god heresy. held in venice i think that what the the catholic church was more afraid of was the belief that he took from you know the ancient text from hermeticism that the divine power is within us not necessarily that we would need the Catholic Church to uh, rule over all the doctrine and and uh, and basically that we had the power within us. And I think that was a big part of the problem um, oh, yeah. that the Catholic Church saw, and they, they had to they had to put that put that fire out as fast as they possibly could by lighting a fire. <laughs> well, I'd say at, at that time, and even to a certain extent at this time, and not to to that degree, if a a minister or a pastor was preaching that Jesus wasn't the sun and that the sun was actually the sun in the sky. He'd probably get whacked back then. And I could, I could see that, but yeah. he would probably not even have a ministry right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, well, you know, I know it was, a, it was a very sensitive thing with Bruno because, uh, he, you know, he came from elite circles and, uh, you know, he was good friends with Galileo, obviously, and of course, Galileo was provided by and the teacher for all the Medici children at this point. So, you know, he was in good circles, obviously good enough circles that Galileo did not meet these same fates. He had the luxury of staying at home, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a big difference. He got the house you arrest. Up rest your life in your home. It's a um, huge difference. I'll you take know, that house arrest. You, you made a good point earlier that he, you know, as he was up and coming. He traveled a lot, and he did meet, like you said, a lot of these, uh, you know, the brilliant minds of the time, and people of power, and he befriended a lot of them, and they all gave him credit, and all that cred, basically gave him the platform to to say all this. And it did, you know, because, actually listen to him. Well, actually, that, after this happened, it really put a lot of pressure on the Inquisition right? because there was a lot of powers that be that felt they had, you know, they. He, they had gone way too far, ultimately, that, you know, the guy obviously was keeping his mouth shut, but the church knew if they let him go, the guy wasn't going to stop telling what he was telling. And, you know, this was a, a man who was, who came from the church, you know, so he was, he was a dangerous person in a time where they were, uh, they were trying to convert people as it was, you know, they didn't need anyone uh, trying to teach something different. And um, it, it's too bad uh, th this has happened to a few people. Uh, you know, uh, Bruno is just an excellent example because he was he was a genius. He's uh, Tim, you mentioned way ahead of his time in in everything in, in astrophysics and quantum physics, uh, and and just in theories too. Um, I know uh, he's he's been the subject of, of so many late discussions, and I think they even made a movie of him recently, uh, possibly. Even an Italian movie, yeah, um, right. uh, you know. But he's um, he's he's a big hero of mine. Uh, you mentioned his hermetic works, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done excellent. Uh, his his theories are excellent. His translations of these things are always great. I know I think uh, that Zachariah was Sitchin pertaining to was the Art of fan. Memory, that book that he wrote, The Art of Memory. I think that that had. Uh, oh. A lot to do with the, his. You know, well, his, think his about it. Think, think about it. Just to hear anyone in the 1500s is is writing a, a a professional piece on the art of memory. You know, we we think of people. This is the dark ages. You know, this is uh, we're just coming into the modern day civilization. You know, is uh, the book still available? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I can get that for you. I, Tim, did I send that one to you, Tim? I don't think you gave me that one. Uh, because Dave, I actually just translated a few of these things. And interesting. I don't know if you're going to find it in English, but I could definitely send you one. Um, it's it's pretty darn cool. Um, you know, he's he's got an interesting way of looking at it all. A lot of it I just don't understand. I believe, 
I, I just, I really don't. Um, and it, it's just because he's also working with other texts that are unavailable. And uh, he's Zachariah Sitchin uh, has been uh, quoting him a lot. Uh, you know, he's especially Tim, like you're saying, with the art of the memory, because he he felt that the Copernican system of astronomy really was the best with in the sense of the earth going around the sun but he he was he would use the word magic a lot and being a magician per se but that was different then that was more of working with elements at particular times like alchemy more than it was palm reading you know he it considered was, it natural science uh, absolutely as magic That's absolutely the magic to him was uh, more or less being in tune with your your nature right and uh, it, it's interesting that uh, between uh, him and a few others right before him but right after his time when they were banning all of his works now uh, they, this is when they actually they literally changed their textbooks in their next editions printed and turned magic in this is when magic became a, an illicit idea this is exactly when it happened. They literally changed the wording in the books. And uh, I even have uh, one of the uh, uh, race miss books that uh, Bruno had. And there's one here I'm going to post in the chat room from Live Science. Dave, I think I even sent it to you today. Uh, it was a, a 16th century book that it's been censored pretty good where not only did they – uh, block out words with like just blotching ink on this thing but <laughs> Stuck pages together. but they even went to the level of making it really nice like they just like painted they it, it nice red and, on, yeah right? put decorative